Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Rob Martin. Welcome to Unpacking the Athlete, a podcast dedicated to diving deep into what makes athletes who they are. Today's guest lives in Michigan and loves pushing the limits with endurance sports. Some of his top accomplishments are as follows. Three Margie Buckles. I repeat, three Margie Buckles. <laughs> he is a six-time Unbound Gravel Fat Bike Champion. He won this year's 30-mile snowshoe run at Polar Roll a few weeks ago, and then he turned around and placed sixth in the Polar Roll Ultra Fat Bike Race. In 2018, he was also second at the Hammer, a.k.a. the now-called Crusher. Our guest today is Roy Kranz, who puts on the Kranza. Welcome, Roy. Let's jump right in. Thanks, Rob. I'm excited to be here, buddy. I'm glad you could be here. If you've listened to any of the podcasts, you know my first question's always off the wall. No different here. <laughs> so I've made up some events. I'm going to have you choose one of them. If you had to choose between these three events because your life depended on it, which event would you choose and why? Number one, swimming six miles, then jumping on the bike for 225 miles of gravel to then running 34 miles on a beach. Number two, snowshoe run 25 miles <laughs> to fat bike immediately 160 miles to cross country ski 40 miles. Three, canoe 75 miles to mountain bike 150 miles to trail run 24 miles. Wow, definitely not number one. I'm not a swimmer. <laughs> um, I, I'm thinking the the second one sounded pretty good, even though it definitely involves winter, I assume, yep. because of the snowshoes. It doesn't sound that terribly different from what I did recently. So I had a blast doing that. I did have some rest in between. So what you proposed would definitely be harder, but you always got to bring it to the next level, right? <laughs> right. Right. I hope Todd doesn't get any ideas here if he's listening. <laughs> All right, let's first talk about the 2022 Margie Duathlon. And first, maybe explain to, to the people listening what it is, where it is, and then after you do that, maybe walk us through your race. Yeah, so the uh, Margie Gessick is a 100-mile course. That's the main event. It's It's advertised as 100 miles. It's always more than that, of course, because it's Todd Poquette. Traditionally, it was done all on the bike, the mountain bike. And if you could finish on the bike under 12 hours, you would get the hand forge belt buckle, which very few people typically get. I think one year, Wakely was sixth place and there were seven buckles. So you pretty much had to beat Jordan Wakely to buckle that year. And it keeps getting harder, I think. 2015 is the only year I didn't do it. 2016 is when I started. I had no idea what I was getting into, but squeaked out a buckle on the bike and then was never close after that. But then I heard about this duathlon, which is basically 64 miles of biking, which gets you to Jackson Mine Park. And then the last 40 or 42 miles you run through Ramba. And I never had been a runner. I had a literally had a 0, 0.0 sticker. I don't run on my car, but I knew I was never getting another, another buckle in the bike. And I, I thought, well, I need to get 10 more hours to do it this way. I'm going to become a runner. So 2020 is the year I thought I was going to do it, but of course the race got canceled. 2021 is the first year I did it, had a blast. And then last year I did it again. The first year I had about three hours on the cutoff, but last year was much closer. I walked uh, quite a bit at the end. Probably, I don't, I think I got it by like 20 minutes or something, but it's definitely the easiest buckle, although it takes a long time because you could be out there for well over 20 hours. I think 2021 was a little more memorable just because it was the first year and I was being chased by a woman who buckled in the 100-mile run, so I knew that it was unlikely I was going to be able to hold her off, but it was very inspiring. 
and pushed me super hard. Christy McBride is her name, and she's actually completed all three, the 100-mile run, the 100-mile bike, and the 100-mile duathlon. She's buckled in two out of three. And by the end, we were within sight of each other, and I, I was able to luckily hold her off. But it was she pushed me a lot, which was good. And last year, I was more about just, I, I want to buckle again. I don't care how I finish as far as position. So I was able to accomplish that, but I, I wish I hadn't walked so much. I'm hoping that I can run a little bit more this year. What time do they usually get you guys started in that event? We start with the bikers at 7.30, I think, is when it starts in the morning. So it's just getting light out in September in Marquette. You know, you have, like I said, 12 hours for the bike, 22 currently for the duathlon, and I think 28 for the run, which I've considered. I'd like to think I have a chance at a buckle, and I'm pretty sure I don't in that. So I, I think I'll stick to the duathlon. It's, it's so much fun. I mean, you get to do kind of like two races in one. And when you get to Jackson Park, when you're so sick of biking, you get to get rid of the bike, which you're pushing a lot of the time anyway in Ramba. So it's it's really the perfect race, and it's a lot of fun. So Ramba, you finish with Ramba on the run then in the duathlon. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, it's the same course as the bikes. Okay. When you get to that spot, I'm guessing it's probably dark then or close to dark. I've gotten there in, I think, about eight hours. So it's typically still light out at the first time you get there, but you get there twice. So you get there at 64 miles and then you go out for about a 20 mile loop. And then it's usually dark by the time I get back there. And then you have that last 15 or 20 miles uh, back into Ishpeming. Okay. So and it's definitely yeah. dark by then if you're not on the bike. Right. And then you're throwing a headlamp on or more than one. What, what do you do to be able to see those crazy trails? Because I know they're very technical. Yeah, I've used a waist light and also a headlamp. You can have a support person meet you along the way as long as they're neutral support. So they have to have gear, whatever they're giving you, they have to be able to give that out to other people that need it if they come by and ask for it. Luckily, I've got a great support guy that helps me in most of the events. And we have certain places that we meet up. So you never have to carry more than, you know, three hours worth of stuff, even though you're out there for a long time running. <laughs> yeah. How long is the run usually for that 40 miles or 42 miles? You mean how long does it take? Yeah. How long does it take? Well, the first year, I think I was right around 19 hours total. So probably 11 hours, 11 to 13 hours on the run. What kind of shoes are you wearing then? I like the Hoka One One Speed Goats, um, although I don't like the newer ones. The tongue is super thin and it kind of cuts into the top of your foot. With the shoelaces? Yeah, like the tongue, the laces go over the tongue, but the tongue on the newer version is like, kind of thick it's not thick it's thin it's not padded at all so the the twos and the threes I, I still look for those you know sometimes people have a big collection of shoes and <laughs> and then they sell them off a few years later when they realize they're not going to use them and so I'm always looking for those shoes and occasionally you find a new pair somewhere and yeah but they're su super light and they have a lot of cushion and so they're they're pretty comfortable yeah I, I definitely like the Hoka's and that shoe you're talking about, I, I agree. The new ones, the, the tongue is too thin and I get pressure on the top of my foot. Right. So it's just, it's just not comfortable like it used to be. So if, yeah, I don't know. If you find something else that works good, make sure you well, let me know. <laughs> well, what's your size? I'll, I'll search for you when I'm looking for mine. I'm a 10. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll keep my eyes open. I'm a 13, so we're not competing. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> 13. Wow. How tall are you? Oh, six foot. Okay. All right. Let's move on to Unbound Gravel and talk about six-time fat bike champ. What distance are you doing? The 200 every time. That's actually the only distance that they have a fat bike category. They, they also have a 100-mile race, a 50, a 25, and a 350, but none of those have 
different categories like the 200. Wow. So 200 miles, six times, and that's six times in a row, right? Yeah, every time I've done it. And in fact, they started the fat bike category the first year I, I signed up and it was, it was fate, man. It was just, <laughs> I love that race. There's all <laughs> kinds of stuff that can go wrong, but I've been pretty lucky. Yeah, I've heard some horror stories. So that's why I was really impressed with six times in a row being the fat bike champ. Huh. I've had some some stiff competition. I don't you probably know Tom Scott. He's uh yep. I think he he was in the top ten overall at Kansas in twenty fifteen, I believe. Okay. And he he rode fat one year and there's been every year there's a couple guys that I'm definitely concerned about, you know, different people typically each year, but it's uh, it's motivating for sure. Yeah, someone to battle with. <laughs> yeah. Are you planning on doing that race this year? Yeah, I got in again, so I'm excited. My support guy that has come every year, Heath Kaplan, he recently, within the last couple of years, kind of found his love for cycling. So he's actually racing this year. So I gotta, you know, do this with the new support guy, but he's he's awesome too. It shouldn't be a problem, but it's the three of us, Andy Thompson, who's the guy I've always gone with. He's doing the 350. I'm doing the 200 and he's doing the hundred. So, okay. We'll have all, all the big distances covered at least. (laughs) Nice. 350. That just sounds, wow. That sounds like a lot. It sounds silly, doesn't it? It does sound silly. I mean, it's almost double 200. Right. (laughs) What kind of stuff do you carry with you on that race? Well, definitely a pump and plugs, tire plugs, tubes, food, probably between like three and five bottles of water per stage. I mean, there's typically there's it's split into four sections. And early when I was doing this, they had you could meet your support every 50 or 60 miles. But enough people quit at the halfway point that they've taken that out as a as a manned station. You can stop there and get water, but there's no support crews allowed. And you can't meet your support anywhere on the course other than the designated spots. So you see them around mile 50 and a mile 150, and that's it. So you have to get, you know, and it gets hot. It's usually in the 90s. There's almost no shade on the course. It's often windy. And it's beautiful. I mean, you you wouldn't necessarily think that with Kansas, but the the whole town comes out for this event. There's people that have coolers at the end of their driveways, spraying you off with water, and you know <laughs> you come you come into town, the entire main street is shut down, and they have a big party with food trucks and fences, you know, like that you go through to get to the finish. And there's kids that want to slap your hand on the way in. I mean, it's it's pretty special. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking back to the six that you've done, what year was the hardest? And can you walk us through that? Last year was pretty tough because it was mud. It was, you know, they they had their really muddy year in 2015, which, you know, looked miserable and made tons of people want to do the race. But (laughs) for five years in a row, I had none of that. There was never any mud. And last year it was, there were two sections that were super muddy and it's amazing how quickly the conditions changed because the first one, I saw a lot of people walking and it was quite lengthy and I rode the whole thing and I thought, this is great. I passed like 40 people. And then I got to the second one and I saw the people walking. This is in the last 25 miles, you know, so you think you're almost done and then you hit another mud section (laughs) And I thought, I'm going to ride past all these people. And my bike got so full of mud that I had, I couldn't push it downhill. I mean, it was, it it weighed a hundred pounds for sure. And I had nothing to scrape the mud off. I'm just using my fingernails. And luckily at the end of this, there was a river. So I was able to wash, you know, the mud off enough to finish. But I heard the guys on fat bikes that were behind me had to walk the first one and they were able to ride the second one. So within a couple hours, things had changed dramatically condition wise, but it was, you know, it was pretty tough. It wasn't as hot. So that was good. I usually push pretty hard in that race. You you never really know where you stand. 
you don't know if there's three or four fat bikers working together trying to catch you. I mean, I'm looking behind myself quite a bit, looking for fat tires. And so you never really know what kind of gap you have. So you push hard the whole time. That definitely sounds like a struggle with all the mud, especially when it's sticking to your bike like that. I, I, <laughs> you say a hundred pounds and I can imagine it weighing a lot just with the, the caking of the mud. I mean, water weighs a lot and then you add dirt to it. <laughs> it was brutal. Let's talk about what was the hardest out of the crusher, Margie, and polar rolls and why which one of those events was the toughest for you i would say oddly enough it was the 2020 ex crusher the 225 which was more like 253 or something <laughs> um, i did that with a, a buddy of mine jake romacle it was like the only real event we did the whole year because it was 2020 i think that's the year they started the ex stuff but you had to Within the first five miles, you're dragging your bike up Hogback Mountain in Marquette. And it was, I don't remember how many hours it took, but it, we started in the dark, went through an entire day and went through an entire night and finished the next morning. Cool. And it was, it was brutal. So I remember at one point in the middle of the night, I just told Jake, I need to lie down. I just laid right in the middle of the road, looked up at the stars and he goes, you, you want a caffeine gel? I'm like, that'd be great. <laughs> so he gave me one and it was like magic. It, it really worked wonders, but that was, you know, it's, it's also tough to, it's a little bit easier to get pumped up and push harder if you have all these people around you. And we were one of the only ones out there because you could pick any weekend you wanted or any week you wanted for the whole summer. And so we just picked a week that worked for us. But And we saw a few other people on the course, but for the most part with the EX, the whole yeah. idea is you pick the time and you go when you want. So, I mean, we, we, did, we did fine, but, and I did attempt it one more time after that with some really fast guys and couple of us ended up bailing. Somebody had a medical issue and, but I'm not, not dying to do that again. That's a lot of work. You're not dying to do that again. <laughs> it's funny. You mentioned the caffeine. I ride with some guys too. And when they get feeling like that, they reach for the Red Bull because they think Red Bull gives them wings, just like it says in the commercials. Nice. So, <laughs> I almost pictured you saying that cause you were just, yeah, it worked. So yeah, um, someone, uh, Brian Geschel that I rode with at the, the bike ultra, he had a Red Bull that he shared with me during that event. Cause that took 23 hours and yeah. it really, it, I don't know if it was psychological or it really did something physically, but it seemed to work even a half of one. Yeah. Huh. You guys are lucky. I, the caffeine doesn't work well with me, so I just can't do those kinds of things. So yeah, I, that's not good. Yeah. So I, I get, um, water does me good. <laughs> nice. During that crusher, the one that you finished, did you ever think of quitting? I mean, we definitely, I definitely crossed my mind that it's always nice to be with somebody because you don't want to let them down. So you don't want to suggest quitting, especially if it's only one other person, because you know how hard it is to go on alone. So usually what happens in these kind of things, whether it's a, a crazy long hike or a run or whatever... If you're with one other person at the end, you both say, oh, man, I really wanted to quit. And oh, really? Me too. You know, but <laughs> we're so glad that we didn't mention it to each other. But but honestly, that event, I looked at the possibility of quitting. There's it's like maybe a mile or two shorter. I mean, it's so remote that there's no obvious way out, especially if you don't have a support person, which we didn't. Right. So it's kind of like you're you're just invested enough so that quitting makes no sense. I mean, there's no shorter way out than the way you're going to go anyway, so <laughs> right. which is good and bad. I mean, it's bad if you really need to get out, but it's uh, good if you're just fighting those demons that make you want to quit. That makes sense. Both roads are long, so you might as well just finish. Right. Huh. Well, I've had a lot of requests to talk about Polar Roll. So let's move on to this year's Polar Roll 2023. And let's first talk about 
what made you decide to do the snowshoe run on Saturday and then turn around and do the ultra fat bike race on a Monday? So I tried one other ultra a few years ago, the Tuscobia, and it was miserable. It was negative 16. The wind chill was negative 35. And 19 or 20 miles in, I got a flat. And I had seen pictures of people with black toes and, you know, oh. you know, missing fingers. And I'm like, I do, I tried to pump it up. I tried to, you know, there was no obvious hole that I could plug. Apparently the bike shop had done something with the valve incorrectly, but honestly it was the best flat tire I ever got. Cause I was happy to be done. <laughs> um, and I immediately sold all the stuff that I needed for that race. So I would never be tempted to try anything like that ever again. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something special about being part of the very first one. And they, they really hyped up this polar roll ultra and Todd initially had posted something that said, can you imagine a 75 mile polar roll? And I thought that sounds really good. And then, <laughs> you know, a few days later it was like, well, we're going to round it up to a hundred. And I'm like, Oh, that's probably pretty good. And then he started talking about 140. I'm like, screw that. I'm not doing that. <laughs> and it was initially going to be on Saturday, but they were worried about snowmobiles. So they moved it to Monday and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to take time off of work. But Monday was a holiday. So that kind of worked out. And as we got closer, there were all these idyllic posts about how good the conditions were and how beautiful the course was. And I looked at the weather and it looked really reasonable, like, you know, highs in the 20s, not negative 20s. Right. And so I started regretting and, and I had this fear of missing out on the ultra, I know, <laughs> but I had trained so much for the, the snowshoe thing. I had within a four week period, I had ran more than three marathons, you know, like 26, one day, 30, another day, 26, another day. And so I just thought I put so much work into this. I don't want to give it up. So I just thought maybe I can do both. I mean... I just thought as long as it, my goal was just to finish the ultra, which is really what it was, I reached out to Brian Geschel because every race that we do together, we always see each other. So we have to be fairly compatible. So I reached out to him. I go, dude, we need to ride together. It's so much better to be with someone than to be alone. And he yeah. said, I, I got three goals. He goes, I don't want to hammer too hard. I want to stay warm and I don't want to stop too much. And I said, that sounds perfect. So we were together from the very start all the way to the finish, and we were both very glad we had someone to share it with. And, you know, he's he's a great guy. He kept positive the whole time. It was it was very nice. We saw a lot of people that were by themselves in the dark, you know, tired and potentially yeah. hallucinating and no one to talk to. And I thought, man, that would have sucked. So I was so <laughs> glad to have Brian. Yeah, that's so, cool. You guys were able to team up. Right. Yeah, it was very, very nice. I still think it's crazy that you did that on the, <laughs> the same weekend. But anyway, why don't you move on and talk us about how the run went? Walk us through the run, maybe from start to finish, any hard parts, good parts? Backing up just a little bit, the, the run last year, everyone who finished the 30-mile snowshoe run got the polar roll buckle, which I, I've never thought I would ever be able to earn one of these buckles because in the bike, you got to be absolutely the elite, you know, like probably you could get one, but Wakely, Acker, those are the kind of guys that are getting the buckles on the bike. And so when I saw that the buckle was in play for the snowshoe run, I thought, you know, I could probably do this. And like, there's at the time, there were only two other guys signed up. So I'm like, all I got to do is, you know, if I beat two people, maybe they won't give it to everybody. But if you win, you're going to get it. Yeah. And so that was definitely a motivating factor. But then Todd said, oh, no, we're only doing buckles for the ultra. So then I'm like, well, maybe I do have to do this ultra, you know, just because <laughs> all you got to do is finish that. You don't have to be in the top, whatever. And so anyway, the run started, only one of the other two guys showed up. And at the starting line, I learned that he had finished the 100 mile run at Margie. So I'm like, well, I'm going to be second place today. <laughs> but you know, I figured maybe I can lead for a little bit. So we ran up Hill Street at the beginning. It's paved, so you don't have to have the snowshoes on. So we had to stop and it was kind of crowded at trying to get onto the single track. 
And so we put on our snowshoes and I got mine on a little quicker than his, Tyler's. I said, all right, I'll see you, Tyler. And I thought for sure he'd pass me and I just kept running and I never saw him. And it was, it was kind of lonely though, because, you know, all you saw was a few other bikers and saw a lot of the same people over and over, which was cool. But I, I got a little bit bored out there. And so I wanted to have some fun and you have the first and last name on, on your number plate. So I just acted like I knew everybody that went by, you know, the, I saw, <laughs> I said, Hey, Mary, how's it going? Marco, what's up? And these people would be like, uh, do I know you? And I'm like, yeah, we're old friends. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think people really wondered how I knew their names, you know, I mean, it was on their plate, but they didn't consider that. <laughs> and so hilarious. at the end, when I was in the cafeteria getting my free soup, you know, at the end of this thing. I had people coming up to me. How do I know you? I'm like, well, we didn't really know each other, but now we're friends. <laughs> and so I made made a few new friends that way, and it was it was a good time. Plus, you know, I do the videos for Todd, so I kept it kind of fun and fresh. You know, pulling out the camera every now and again, and saw people that were carrying their bikes and people that were laying on the ground because they had wiped out. And so I got all this on video and talked to some people, and it was a good time. Heck yeah. That's awesome. I was definitely tired by the end. And unlike most Todd events, it was advertised as a 30 mile snowshoe run and it was really more like 26 miles. So that was, that was a nice little treat that it was instead of longer than it's advertised, it was a little bit shorter. Yeah. I was not complaining. Yeah. That's odd, isn't it? Yeah. Uh (laughs) How about, now let's talk about the grueling 23 hour ultra. And can you talk about that race from start to finish? Yeah, I was nervous for sure. Especially after my first ultra attempt, you know, nobody had ridden this course. It was brand new. They had tried to keep it groomed. And at the beginning it was dark when we started and Brian and I had committed to ride together, but he wasn't quite ready at the start when they went off. So we were kind of the last two guys to to, to roll out. Hmm. Um, but people, you know, a lot of people stayed together. Obviously, you know, Wakeley's a complete animal and he was off the front, I'm sure, right at the beginning and nobody ever saw him again. But, you know, so it was dark for a while. It was pretty well groomed. It was pretty. There wasn't a sense that you needed to to go too hard because you knew you had such a long way to go. And you knew Rambo was at the end, which was that definitely weighed on me a lot because I knew from running it a couple of days earlier how many hills there were and how tough <laughs> it was. I saw a lot of people walking their bikes downhill even at, at that race. So I knew with, you know, you got to carry so much stuff in the ultra. You've got a negative 20 degree sleeping bag. You have an insulated sleeping pad. You have a bivy sack, which is like a little tent. You have to carry a stove and two fuel containers, 3,000 calories worth of food that you don't eat, and a bunch of other stuff. And you have to show this stuff at the end to prove that you carried it the whole time. There's no gear dumping when you get to Ishpeming before you do Ramba. And it had snowed quite a bit throughout the day. Um, We had pretty good conditions, but once it got dark, it was really snowing hard. And so even though there were four or five people ahead of us, we usually could only see the tracks of the guy that was just ahead of us. And the people that had gone through hours earlier, you couldn't even see their tracks because there was so much snow. And we had studded tires and Rambo was perfect for studs on Saturday. But once you got five or six inches of fresh snow, the studs were worthless. I fell off my bike 50 times. I still have some pain in my chest. And Oh, man. Yeah, so it was it was pretty grueling. It, surprisingly, I didn't feel tired in the sense that my legs were tired, but like sleepy tired, I was definitely sleepy tired, like I wanted to sleep. But when we'd hit the hills we could climb in Rambo, I didn't have any problem, you know, putting it in the, the easiest gear and going up the hill. I think it helped too to have Brian there just, you know, keeping us moving and but I didn't do any video at all in Rambo. I didn't have the helmet mount because I was worried about the batteries dying quickly in the cold. So I kept the camera in my pogey and I'd just take it out and film, but then you're one-handed. You don't want to be one-handed. I was falling down with two hands in Rambo. So (laughs) 
Oh man, I can't imagine all the the snow building up in those. So were some of those crashes going downhill fast then? A couple, yeah. I mean, I definitely had some that knocked the wind out of me and Ugh. maybe brought out a few bad words. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can only imagine because when I was so I I raced Saturday. And when we were going, it, and it was a little icy. Some other spots were a little icy still, because I think they had got like an inch and a half of rain the week before. Wow. So there was some um, icy stuff, but they had done a pretty good job of roughing up the trail so that you were, you know, it was more grippy than icy. But there's some fast, like, you, I don't know if people haven't been to Ramba, they're not going to understand like <laughs> how fast and steep some of the downhills are for fat biking. I mean, it's, it's fine if you're on a mountain bike and you're on dirt, but it's totally different with the undulations in the, the groomed track and, and how fast you're going. And uh, it's, it's, I was scared a couple of times just to be honest. And I, I can't imagine being in the dark and with all the extra snow, I would, I, I don't know. I might've been the guy walking down the hill instead of riding down the hill. Well, and we had a lot of extra gear, which made the bike unstable too. So yeah, it was, it was rough. It was, we didn't have a problem walking, you know, some of the stuff that we maybe normally could have ridden in a, if we were fresh and didn't have all the gear. So there was, there was lots of bike pushing for sure. Yeah. how did it feel to finish? I mean, it was, it was a relief for sure. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I didn't have a hotel or anything booked and I lived six hours from there. And it was snowing hard when we got done. So a lot of people were sleeping on the bike store floor. So I oh. set up my sleeping bag and sleeping pad and tried to sleep, but it was it was a lost cause. So ended up driving a couple hours till I got tired and then slept on the side of the road for a bit. We actually stopped at the store before Ramba too, because it was open all night, the West End store. And Acker was in there. He shared some pizza with us. And, uh, you know, he had finished, of course, already. And I, I was definitely quiet. I was just kind of dreading the last little bit because I knew it was going to take a long time. Eventually, we just, you know, said we had to get it done. We had gone this far. We might as well finish. And you guys finished together. Yep. A yeah, that was day. nice. Nice. That's really cool. And, and neither of you guys had any mechanicals out on the trail? No, no mechanicals. I don't think there was one Kelly Judnack we saw at one of the checkpoints and he was he was going strong, but he had, I think, a, had tried some new long underwear and it had a seam in the wrong place. And Ooh. so he had his his butt was really hurting and he had to withdraw. Unfortunately, he was pretty bummed about that. But I didn't hear about anybody else having any kind of gear issues or anything like that. So that's a good point. When you do something, you know, racing or an ultra race, not to try something new on race day. Go with what you're used to and and go with what works. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. To answer your question, I last year I did get a buckle in the polar roll. You're a so. beast. Beast. <laughs> no, I'm not the beast. Wakeley's the beast. <laughs> so did you get one this year? Because you were sixth place, right? No, there were no buckles this year. Oh, that's right. Only for the ultra. Okay. Remember, only the ultra guys yeah. got them. Right. Yeah. No. No buckles. <laughs> but got mine last year, so I'm I'm good to go. Nice. <laughs> that's the coolest buckle with the the bear head on it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I was I was pretty stoked to get that. That was uh that was pretty cool. Nice. I think I should make it into a belt, you know, and and get a belt that fits that big buckle because it'd have to be a pretty big belt and just wear that to races for intimidation, oh, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> While you're racing that, I love it. Yeah. I've never heard of that. That'd be funny. <laughs> yeah, that's a good oh. one. Oh, boy. Okay, let's see. All throughout your whole career on, on bikes, what's been your favorite bike that you've ever had along the way? The Bucksaw, Salsa Bucksaw. And why? It's a full suspension mountain bike, well, fat bike. It's uh, I guess it's just what the first bike I ever had that, got me into these long endurance races. So 2014, I did well training myself with the Mountain Mountain Bikers Training Bible by Joe Friel. And then I hired Brian Motter, the guy who's won Iceman a number of times, 
And I focused on those kind of races for 2015, but it was honestly not a terribly fun year because it was so structured and so many intervals and he kicked my butt. <laughs> I mean, it paid off. I was uh, had my best Iceman race. I think I was 16th out of the non-pros and 65th overall. But, you know, I, I had gotten a gift card at a race for Grand Rapids Bicycle Company. And I went to one of the stores while I was in town for work in Grand Rapids. I think they had three locations and I just picked the closest one. And Tyler Cuning was in there and he was going on and on about the Margie Gessick and the dirty Kanza. And I mean, he just like, he was, he made me fall in love with those races before I'd ever even tried them. And so that next year, I just focused on that long stuff and really got into it and found what I really enjoyed. You know, it's nice because you can have a flat, you can have a bad start, you can have whatever, and you've got, you know, 14 hours to make up for it. You know, it's not like the cross country races where if you're not one of the first three or four guys in the woods, you're not going to win, you know? And so there's so much more intensity and pressure in those shorter races and it seems like too that the the friendliness of the competitors the longer the race the more friendly people are and helpful and you know I've done order shore a bunch of times and I've had people that have you know kind of like crashed in front of me and other people are calling them bad words and getting upset with them and it's just like dude it's just a race we're just out here having fun yeah. The, the longer races, if you have a problem, then people offer to help you. And yeah, it's just, it's so much more laid back. And you don't, you really don't have to do a whole lot of intervals in your training. You never have to go super hard. There's, you know, rarely going to be a sprint situation. And it's a different kind of suffering, of course, when you're in the saddle for 14 hours. But <laughs> it's just, I don't know. So, yeah. I think we're, it might have gotten way off topic. I can't even remember what the question was, but you we were talking about your favorite bike. Yeah. So the Bucksaw was, you know, what I started doing dirty cans on. I did it the first two years. And if I could only own one bike, it'd be that bike. I don't own it anymore, but it's <laughs> uh it's definitely was one that changed kind of the direction of the things I was doing and for the better. And so there's definitely some nostalgia there for that bike. What fat bike did you roll for Polar Roll? I've got a, a newer, it's actually Matt Acker's old Bear Grease, the the orange one, the 2019. I bought it from him. And so I had an older Bear Grease, but I wanted one that had a little better tire clearance and would have a rear rack compatibility because I used the pannier bags for that race. And plus his was a 12 speed and the one I had before was an 11 he had, you know, really nice head carbon wheels on it. So it was definitely worth the upgrade. It's a, it's an, and Brian Geschel, the guy I rode with had the exact same bike, same colors and everything. I, <laughs> I, like half, halfway through the ride, we're 12 hours in. I said, by the way, I love your bike. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> when I'm racing, if I see someone with the same bike, I do the same thing. And, it, and they usually turn around and they go, oh yeah, nice bike. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys looked like a team out there with the same bikes. Yeah, there was uh, there was some of that going on for sure. I'm sure there was lots of. I think even Wakely had a beer grease. I could be wrong about that, but I've seen some pictures of what he's been rolling on recently, and it looked like the that blue to red beer grease. I don't know if that's last year or this year. Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure what he, I can't remember. I know I'm on a beer grease as well. I like it. Nice. Yeah, it's a great bike. Yeah. What what does your bike weigh without all the stuff on it? Ish. Um, I I don't even know. I would I would say you know mid mid twenties, twenty six, something like that maybe. And then, do you know what it weighed with all the gear for that ultra? I did not want to know, so I did not <laughs> weigh it. <laughs> Dang I mean, it! That was a, I wanted to know the answer to that. <laughs> oh, I mean, I had enough water capacity. I had three twenty-five ounce bottles and two thirty-two ounce bottles, so I was carrying, you know, more than a gallon of water at a time. Yeah. So that's eight pounds right there, just in water, not including the bottles. It was, <laughs> yeah. it was ridiculous, and. 
But, you know, I, I took a Gore-Tex shell, I took a puffy jacket, and I used all that stuff. I mean, it wasn't brutally cold, but it's still, yeah. it's hard to, hard to keep your body temperature regulated throughout that many hours. And Yeah. Yeah, the, the sweat and the cold makes it hard. For sure. When you get wet and you get cold and you realize, like, this is going to be like this for a while, that's that's definitely not a good feeling. No, like you said, it it is scary. <laughs> in the summer, you don't have to worry about that. So right. people, I just had a conversation with someone and they were talking about ice baths. And I said, you know, half the year here, <laughs> we ride. And when you stop, you're taking an ice bath. I don't need an ice bath. <laughs> I need to get into a hot tub. <laughs> nice. So at this point in your life, would you rather race your bike, chase a good KOM or go on an adventure ride with friends? And what's the reasoning? Definitely the adventure ride with friends. My my motto this year is less race and more adventure. Did some some really cool stuff last year, a, a hike, like a backpacking type hike, but in one day with my son in Utah. We backpacked at Lake Superior Provincial Park. I ran 86 miles at Pictured Rocks, you know, just for fun with some buddies. And that was, that was the stuff I enjoyed the most. I still like the racing, but it's just, you know, that time spent with the people that you love is, is really special. And as you get older, I'm 50, I start appreciating everything so much more because you never know when it's going to be over, you know? Right. Yeah. No, you're right. I like that answer. Let's rewind a little bit and maybe talk about where you grew up and maybe what schools you went to and through. Yeah, I, I grew up in Battle Creek, Michigan, went to Lakeview High School, Grand Valley for undergrad, got my degree in photography, oh. and, then, and then went to Cooley Law School because I didn't want to take senior pictures uh, as a living <laughs> for the rest of my life. Been a prosecutor for over 25 years, and I'm working in federal court now, and I do all the Indian violence from the Isabella Reservation in Mount Pleasant, so lots of sexual assault, uh, stabbing, strangulation, murder, child abuse, things like that. So the not so good stuff. Yeah, but you know, they, it, it, it's, it's very rewarding. And a lot of these guys are getting lengthy sentences. And sometimes the victims will say at the end of a trial where the guy gets convicted and gets 70 years in prison that you've saved my life. I mean, that's pretty, no, pretty yeah. rewarding stuff. Yeah, that's actually pretty cool then you have to, to get that side of it. I wasn't right. thinking about, I guess, that side of it. But yeah, that's definitely rewarding, saving someone's life. How did you go from photography to that? You know, it's it's <laughs> it's not <laughs> like I wanted to be a lawyer all my life. I, I just realized that the, the photographers I knew didn't know where their next meal were coming from. And so Grand Valley had a law school night, you know, where you could go and learn about law school. So I thought, oh, you know, I'll go check that out. And there were only Cooley Law School in Lansing and then Detroit Law Schools and then U of M. And I don't like Detroit, all the traffic. I wasn't going there and I was never getting into U of M. So I only applied at one school and got in. And I thought, well, we'll go for one semester and see how it goes. But honestly, once you're in for that much, you borrowed so much money that you're in for good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but luckily I found something I really enjoy and, you know, it's rewarding and it turned out really good, even though it wasn't something that I had planned out as something I wanted to do. And yeah, it allows, there's enough time off. So I get to do a lot of these fun events. And so I work with good people too. So it's hard to complain. Yeah. And that's actually probably good for some of the young kids to hear, especially through this era that we've been going through where maybe they don't know what they're doing or we've got this this weird, you know, they had a weird couple of years of school not knowing what was going to happen where you you finished undergrad and you still were like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then you found your way. So there's always hope and don't don't ever give up. Keep moving forward. Absolutely. <laughs> do you remember how you got started on the bike? My, my dad bought a bike for me with, you know, training wheels as a kid. And I biked everywhere because you that's the, the form of transportation you had as a kid. 
So luckily had a lot of friends that were into that, but we also had BMX racing in Battle Creek. So while I never trained or did any weights or anything like that to, to get better, I would do a lot of racing and never won any of them. I think I had second once, but that got me into it. And then there was the lull of biking, you know, in college and law school where I didn't do anything. And then bought a bike and just, you know, rode a few hundred miles a year. And then eventually I had gotten talked into doing the 2002 Iceman. And that was, that was a disaster. I broke the chain twice and ended up being really sick on the way home and didn't race again for like almost 10 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then I got talked into doing the 48 mile or to shore and I finished that and I felt so proud of myself. It was such a great race. And I looked at my finishing, you know, position and I thought, man, I suck. What, what happened? You know, I thought I was this, this beast that finished this 48 mile race, but I weighed myself and I was over 210 pounds. And I'm like, this, this has got to change. And so for the next year, I lost, you know, 30 something pounds and shaved 40 minutes off my time. And it just, kind of became an obsession and really enjoy I enjoy the process too not just the races but yeah you know the workouts every day and you know setting goals and things I hate doing the goals at work but I love doing them for the bike you know so <laughs> right yeah. yeah there's something about that it's totally different <laughs> right yeah when you don't have to do it but you want to do it instead yeah. of being forced to do it yeah <laughs> so that that's kind of what did it and I I did a race in 2013 where a neighbor of mine who was older than me started behind me and he caught me. It was at Hanson Hills. And I thought, well, I know Simon. I'm going to stick with Simon. And I couldn't stick with him. And I thought, this guy's like 10 years older than me. What's going on? <laughs> so I talked to him afterwards and I said, what's your secret, man? You got to share. And he says, well, I, I did the Mountain Bikers Training Bible by Joe Friel. He goes, you just got to do that program. And so I'm like, I think I own that book. It came with a bike I bought. Somebody had given it to me. So I found it in the basement and I highlighted the heck out of that thing and went through it and did the plan. And I went from my best finish being sixth place in sport to winning every sport race I did the next year and then moving up to expert and podium every expert race. And then the next year is when I hired Brian Motter and had a, a really good finish to my year. And then I got into the long stuff after that, and I've just been kind of coaching myself. I only did the modder plan for one year, but it was it was definitely enlightening, and I still use some of the stuff he taught me. So, yeah, that's really cool. That's a good story. I, I was surprised to hear the ten year gap, though. <laughs> I think it was well. Oh, for the races, yeah. I mean, it was such a miserable experience. The Ice Man. It was. Just because I the chain broke twice, and the first time somebody I didn't, of course, have a chain tool. I had no idea what I was doing. It, this was like an eight hundred dollar truck bike. Yeah, somebody stopped and fixed my chain. I was so thankful, but then <laughs> it broke again near the end, and I just thought I'm just going to push it in. But you get to the end, and there's all these barriers, and I thought I don't want to screw up somebody else's race, so I'm going to walk outside the barriers. And when I got to the end, I got to the finish, but I never went over the mat because I wasn't inside the barrier. So officially, I never finished that race, even though I actually got to the end on my own power. Yeah. But on the way home, I was like as sick as I've been in forever. And I just thought, you know, I blamed it on the race because of the weather. I'm sure it wasn't that. I'm sure I was sick before <laughs> the race. But that definitely like all that together made me be like, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Huh. Thinking back to your past again, what other sports and activities did you do when you were growing up? I mean, I, I definitely did the, you know, basketball and baseball. I was never any good at any of that, but I, I was the captain of the tennis team in high school, but really, you know, biking's what I've always loved. And I just recently got into running a couple years ago. So it's been a nice kind of cross training, nice to mix it up a little bit. You can go out in the winter and run in shorts when it's 20 degrees and you don't get cold like you do on the bike. I mean, right, yeah. at, the beginning, right at the beginning, you're cold, but you know, you can, you can wear just your normal shoes. And as long as the trail's packed in and 
So I never run on pavement though, because I'm worried about messing up my knees or whatever. So I only do trails. And I think that probably helps too, because sometimes I get to the end of a run and there's just a parking lot to cross. And I cross that and go, man, that really hurts compared to the the (laughs) dirt. It's amazing how different it is. I agree 100% with that. I run in the trails over here at uh, Coast Guard Park. I will not run on the bike path or the road because it's just too much impact for my body. I think I, yeah, I just, I can't do it. So the trails for me and I still do a little bit of basketball too. Nice. Um, to kind of mix it up but yeah the the hard roads there's something about that that just does not work and i think that you're smart for not (laughs) running on those i agree plus the woods are just so much more interesting too yes yes what the woods the nature the wildlife it's refreshing right (laughs) did you ever have a hero on the bike anyone you looked up to Honestly, I, of course, Lance was a hero growing up and, you know, just watching the tour and stuff. But my hero is Matt Acker because he's just, he's a total beast on the bike and he's a hell of a nice guy and he's very humble and he's encourages people when he comes up on them. And, you know, I've been lapped before by him, so I know what it feels like to get his encouragement. And he's always He's always at these checkpoints after he's finished, like at Margie, encouraging people. And he's just a great ambassador and he's a good guy. So that's my bike hero. He's a good bike hero. He is a good guy. (laughs) And you got his fat bike. So that's even better. Yeah. I should have him sign it or something. Yeah, you should. (laughs) (laughs) Especially if you retire that one, then you can hang it on the wall behind you there for good. Nice. (laughs) What was your most memorable race that you've ever done? And can you walk us through that race? Something that we haven't talked about? Yeah, it's it's really hard split between two. And one of them was the 2018 Dirty Kanza. Each year when we go there, we ride, we get there on Thursday. We do a pre-ride on Friday and kind of enjoy the town. And so we did that. And I knew they were going to have the Salsa Chase Lounge there where you you know, get your picture on the, the old fashioned couch kind of thing. Oh yeah. So like somewhere along the course, they have this set up usually near the end. And so I was like, Oh, I need to come up with a cool pose that I can try. So I'm in the hotel room trying to like do the Superman thing on the bike or something. <laughs> and I, I realized there's a huge nail sticking in my tire. That's like it's sealed up, but it's it can see the head of the nail. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is not good. You know, like if that thing comes out, I'm going to have a flat and I might not be able to plug it because it's kind of like a big nail. Yeah. I went to every bike shop in Emporia, Kansas. Not one of them had a single fat bike tire. What? Um, No, (laughs) there was no fat bike tires to be found. But Adam Blake worked at uh, Gravel City Adventure and Supply Company. And when I told him, I had seen him on the internet before giving clinics. And he's just a a hero in the bike industry. And he became my hero that day because even though they were super busy, he drove home, took the tires off his own bike. and, And they were the exact same model that I had on mine. And he basically gave me his tires. And so you know, the race, I wasn't as worried about the tires. My buddy had texted me and said that Jens Voigt was going to be in the race this year. And I I was pretty excited. This was 2018. So it hadn't gotten as big as it is now where it's just tons of pros. And so the the last stage of the race, I, I pull up on this guy and it says Voigt on the back of his jersey. And I go, dude, are you Jens Voigt? Or are you just wearing his jersey? He goes, I'm actually him. And I'm like, that's so freaking awesome. And so we're talking and I'm thinking to myself, all right, I just got to get to the chase lounge with him. I can get my picture taken with him. This is going to be so awesome. And he's like, you're, you're pretty, you got a lot of energy for this late in the race. I'm like, I'm just pumped up. I'm excited. And so we get to the, the chase lounge. I get my picture with him, and I'm so excited. And we got this group of like four guys and we keep rotating and he takes his turn on the front. We're eight miles out. And I look back and he's just off the back of the group. And I said to the other guys, this is the chance of a lifetime. When would you ever think you're going to beat Jens Voigt in a race? We need to go now. <laughs> they're like, 
they're like, I'm tired. I don't want to. And I'm like, I'm going alone. So I just put my head down and hammered his heart. And, you know, of course, Jens wasn't trying. I mean, I'm sure he could have smoked us, but still, I beat Jens Voigt in a bike race. So that was that's, pretty sweet. That's awesome. <laughs> you could put that one on the wall for sure. Yeah, I've got that. Once that race was over, I'm like, I just need to be done with this because it's never going to get any better than this. And... <laughs> You still have the race plate from that? Oh yeah, I absolutely. I got them all. I love, I love <laughs> all the plates. And my wife made up this little thing that, uh, well, this is something you can buy from somebody that lives out there, where it's got your time for each race and whether you oh, beat wow. the sun or not. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Fun That's stuff. Cool. Yeah. What ride? Not a race could be solo or with a group was the most memorable for you. Maybe you had a lot of fun on like an adventure ride or something. And could you paint a picture of that experience? I would say the, you know, the, the most memorable and life changing one would have been when I was 11, my dad said, let's ride our bikes 250 miles to your grandparents' house in four days. What? So we, we lived in Battle Creek. They lived in Harbor beach and, we decided we were going to bike there. We didn't tell them that we were coming on bikes. And so every day we, we <laughs> went, we went 50 to 70 miles and then we'd stay in a little town and we'd walk to the movie theater. And I saw nightmare on Elm street at the movie theater when I was a kid with my dad, the first year I did it, I was on a BMX bike with a hard plastic seat. My butts hurt so bad. Oh. We, we had we had the St. Bernard chase us that was as big as my dad's bike, and he was trying to put his feet up by the handlebars. And it was oh. just a great – I heard so many stories of, you know, when he was growing up. And so it was it was a great bonding trip, and we did it three or four years in a row. But we the first one was probably the most memorable just because it was so hard, and I was 11. And so I blame him for all these crazy long bike races. He got me into it. So, heck yeah! Wow, that's pretty cool. Two hundred and fifty miles to Grandma and Grandpa's house on bikes. And when we got there, they said, "Where's the car?" There is no car. We rode our bikes. They said, "Bullshit! Where's the car?" <laughs> <laughs> so we. So how'd you get back? My my mom and sister came and picked us up in the car. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> which was which was the plan. I mean, we weren't going to go there and back. So right. Yeah, it wow. was hard enough one way. But that was obviously during the summer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, nice. I mean, I was so young that I, when one of the stops we made, I bought Matchbox cars to play with. I mean, I was just I was a little kid, but it was it was impactful for sure. Yeah. Nice. I still buy Matchbox cars. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Do you incorporate any strength training into your routine? And how many days a week, if so? So I do two days a week of weights. I, I, I don't do any lower body stuff, so no squats. My back is kind of messed up. I'm concerned about that, but I do upper body, and then I do core, the P90X, the ab ripper thing. So I just go through that. I, I've been trying to do it since polar roll and I've had such pain and now it feels healed, but I, I jacked it up again. So I'm trying to like stay off the weights for a couple of weeks just so I'm fully healed, but definitely doing that for, you know, because of my age and how you lose muscle mass as you get older. And, and if you're going to do stuff like Margie, that just, you really need to have a strong core and, and arms because you're just shot at the end of that day, fighting the bike all the way up and down the hills. And so yeah, it's, it's not my favorite thing, but I think it is important to do. The more technical stuff you're going to ride, you definitely have to have some, some strength from strength training. Yeah, for sure. Do you spend any time indoors training or is almost everything you do outdoor? I do a lot of trainer rides in the winter. I try and get up to at least one eight hour trainer ride in the winter just to, cause I, I, I just tell myself that my competitors at cans aren't doing that. So it, it's okay. like, you know, trying to, that's the motivation for sure. But I only really watch any kind of TV or movies when I'm on the trainer. So it's kind of like a treat to, to ride the trainer. Cause I get to watch, you know, 
Walking <laughs> Dead or Breaking Bad or something. I try and get into a series. Okay. And then you, you can kick out a long day. You know, of course, I'll get off and use some chamois butter and eat something, go to the bathroom. But pretty much, you know, a, a solid eight-hour trainer ride at least once a year. And, of course, I'm building up to that. I'm not just doing it right out of the gate. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. Okay. So do you spend more time indoor then during the winter or do you spend more time outdoor? Definitely indoor. Um, okay. So, I mean, I'm not riding outside a whole lot in the winter. I mean, even though my bike of choice is a fat bike, it's usually a summer or fall or spring fat bike thing and not a winter, which gotcha. is t- totally weird, but, you know, it's just <laughs> the way it is. What's your go-to hydration drink mix for racing? I like the Naked Tailwind. It's one of the few things I've used that doesn't make me feel sick after hours and hours. That's really the the go-to. Of course, at the end of some of these really long things, you just want plain water. Yeah. But Tailwind seems to be pretty good. It's relatively affordable compared to some of the other stuff. And Yeah, they've got good ingredients. And actually, I think it was last year I switched over to Tailwind as well. Nice. It's my favorite. What about for gels? If you use gels, what, what's your go-to? You know, I, I've kind of tried the last couple of years those SIS the they're almost like water they're heavy and they're kind of bulky but they have electrolytes and I you know, if you get the salted strawberry or something like that I really like the jelly belly sport beans and the cliff blocks like the margarita or the salted watermelon so those kind of a rotation between those maybe some rip van waffle uh, the chocolate brownie stuff that's it's only got like three grams of sugar, but it, you know, gives you a different taste and a different yeah. consistency. I do the SIS gels as well. And that's because when I'm racing, I have a hard time with gels. They get stuck and I don't have enough, like my mouth's too dry. So right, like you said, they're more liquid than a gel and they work really well for me. You can just drink them down instead of trying to choke it down. Right, exactly. <laughs> So if you're someone that has a hard time, try the SIS gels. They're really good. Yep. How about what type of things do you do to recover after a race? It could be devices. It could be food or supplements. What do you have going on for that? So my new favorite thing is the roll recovery. It's basically just this thing that has rollers on the front and back of it, and you can open it up and put it on the front and back of your legs and work it. It's the only thing that I can have get into my hamstrings. You can kind of push those little wheels in there and it's, it's small enough to travel with. It's TSA approved. I'm not sponsored by them or anything. I just really like that device. I actually bought two of them so I can keep one in my car because I forget to bring it when I go running or something. And then I feel like it's too late by the time I get home. I want to do it right at the end of the run. I also have the compression leg sleeves. That's a lot harder to travel with, but seems to be pretty good. And I like the AMP cream too. I don't know if you've used that. Uh, AMP human maybe it's called. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, I have used that. That's that's good like at the beginning of a race, but also yep. for recovery. If you have a really hard day and you put that on, you feel a lot better the next day. So. Yeah, that's a good one too. If there was one race you could do over again, what race would it be and what would you have done differently? You know, I you seem to learn more from when you don't win. So <laughs> I, I don't know that I would change anything. I, I did have one race and this was the one that uh, was kind of competing with the 2018 Kansas as my most memorable but I, I showed up to Sweat Shaker 2015 and a really fast guy that does well and often wins says, well, we're fighting for six today. And I said, what, what are you talking about? And he said, all the fast guys are here. You know, we got Paul Dunn and we got Matt Remoltz and we got Jamie Parker. And so I just felt like the pressure was completely off. This guy that does super well at Iceman is telling me we don't have a chance. (laughs) 
And so it, it just made me relax. And that, that's the course I was most familiar with. So when the gun went off, I went fast and I, I lost everyone. I was off the front for a lap and a half. But then I realized I could never sustain this. So I kind of waited and the front group caught me and it was it was all those guys, Jamie Parker, Matt Remmeltz and uh, Paul Dunn and then me. And it was the end of the second lap. There's a section where you get out on the pavement before you duck back into the single track. And I was in the back of the pack on lap two. And I saw all of them reach for their bottles as soon as they got to the pavement because it's the, the safest time to drink. But I had a camelback. So I thought the next lap I'm attacking right here. It's like two or three miles from the end. And as soon as we got to that section, I just went balls out. I went to the front. Near the end, Paul Dunn tried to pass and almost took us out, you know, like with some trees. Yeah. We got to the finish and he goes, I'm coming around. And I'm like, no, you're not. And so we just went into the line and he won. But it was the best race I ever had. I had a plan. I took chances. And the guy that said we're fighting for sixth, he was sixth. Right. (laughs) <laughs> and, and Paul Dunn came up to me and he goes, who are you? Right. And so it, was, it was the first time we ever met and we had a lot of battles that year and I, I never beat him. I was second to him a lot, but he's a great guy. And so it was, he used to be an elite rider and he probably still is. I mean, he's, I think every race he did that year, he won. Nice. He, yeah, it was fun going. So, I mean, I don't know if there was anything I could have done differently Certainly, that's as close as I've ever come to winning and not won, but I was still incredibly satisfied with, you know, I felt like I did everything I could, and the guy's just better than me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. that's a good race. That's a good race story, too. Yeah, and I've got a picture of us at the end, you know, like it's, we're neck and neck. That's cool. that, That was fun. What events do you have on the calendar for this year? So I'm going to do all the 906 stuff. So we did Polar Roll. I'm going to do Crusher, the Mass Start. That was a lot of fun last year. That's about 185 miles. And it's unlike the EX, it's a real gravel race. You know, I mean, it's hard packs, roads. There's not much sand. There was a couple sections. That was a blast. We We started around sunrise and finished before sunset. So that's nice. Margie, the duathlon in Kansas or Unbound, they call it now. Probably or to shore, but probably not much else. You know, I'll do my my event, but I'm going to ride the Kranza the weekend before so I can play race director on the day of. And yeah, you know, for anybody listening, I've got the Kranza. It's in Tustin, which is just south of Cadillac. It's on May 20th. It's free. It's always been free since 2016. It's uh, on Bike Reg. There's three distances. There's the 170, which is a great warm-up for Kanza. There's an 85 and a 35. And they all start and end at the Center Lake Bible Camp in Tustin. And it's a beautiful course, lots of hills, not much traffic, some interesting seasonal road sections. (laughs) And I make up trophies for it that I get from bike parts from Ray's Bike Shop that donates them to me. And it's a good time. And it's free, so why not come out? (laughs) Right. Put that on your calendars, everybody. Yeah. (laughs) You mentioned 906. How much fun do you have with those kids when you're coaching? And how did you decide to get involved in that? So Todd asked me because they started a group in Midland. And, you know, I got a bromance with Todd. So I do, you know, whatever (laughs) he wants me to do. (laughs) <laughs> and so anyway, it was a good time. They they did not ask what age group we wanted. And so they put me with the youngest kids, which was a riot. I mean, it was, but you know, like if we rode like three or four miles in two hours, that was doing pretty good. Right. They, they just want to, you know, get off and pee in the woods and play in the sand and look for salamanders and but I was, I was like, you know, trying to give them some tough love. Like we'd get out there and within five minutes, one of them be like, I need a snack. And I said, tell your parents to feed you before you come. <laughs> and they'd say, I don't have, I'm getting bit by bugs. Tell your parents to give you some bug spray. You know, like I would just have no, no, uh, you know, I, it was a good time. It was, you know, we had a lot of fun and they really, enjoy it even though it's not really that much about the bike for them they just enjoy getting out there and having an adventure and 
This year, I think I'm going to try the oldest group just to see how that goes, you know, instead of the youngest. And but it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to give back because biking has has been such a big part of my life and it's given me so much. And yeah, it's not that big of a commitment. You know, it starts after school gets out and it ends, you know, before school starts back up. And if you have a vacation, you just let them know you're not going to make it for that week. And you can see the kids developing confidence throughout this and, you know, getting, getting to be better bike handlers. They are fearless too. I mean, there's some, (laughs) there's some crazy features at city forest and they'll just go full speed and launch through the air and they're Superman and off the bikes and just like, (laughs) you know, they look like they're going to cry and you go, wow, that was impressive. You look like Superman. I did, you know, and then they're just (laughs) all proud of it and, (laughs) <laughs> it was it was a it was a blast nice and how many days a week do you guys do that it's just once a week it's once a week uh, every yeah, week for midland for it's mon- monday nights i know in like marquette they have such a big group that they split it up into two nights based on the age of the kids and it's it's not race oriented at all it's just adventure and you know self-exploration so we have another group in midland that's more race oriented the the misca i think it's called misca the i could be saying that wrong but the group that you know go travels to the different races and yep so that's on a different night so kids could do both groups i believe that one's called mid michigan mountain bike crew or something like that and okay that, that's actually been in midland longer than 906 and so you know, we have a couple different groups to choose from, or you can do both. So I, I actually help out with the MISCA team down here. Nice. It's, it's always fun to be around the kids for sure. The energy and watching them grow and seeing them succeed is definitely something cool to experience. Absolutely. How did the Kranza come about? What made you come up with that? The first year, 2016, that I did Kansas, I thought I need to get in some big ride before I do this because I've never ridden that far in my life and I have no idea what I'm getting into. So I just set a date like three or four weeks before the race. I told a couple people and they said they were going to come and then things came up and I at the last minute realized I was doing it alone, which, you know, is fine, but it's not as much fun. And it was, you know, it was mentally tough. There were times in that second lap that I was looking at ways to get back to the car. And I thought, well, this is stupid. I'm not going to be able to <laughs> cut the race short. I just need to suck it up, you know. And <laughs> so I got done. And then I just thought this would be so much more fun if I had other people here. So the next, you know, it just kept growing and growing. And and so, you know, it started off, we might have had like, 11 people the next year and then maybe 25 or something and right now we have over 50 registered already for the may event hopefully we'll you know hit 100 or so there were one guy came from i think it was oklahoma or kansas last year and wow nice so it's it's a it's a really fun event and you know you can't beat the price but that that's the reason i started it was just as a (laughs) warm-up it's you know, 170, they say, if you're going to run a marathon, you shouldn't run 26 miles, you should do 20 or something. So I thought 170 sounded good, but it used to be two 85 mile loops, but you get all these guys saying, I'm going to do the 170. And then they'd get to their car and they'd be like, I think I've had enough. Yep. So I thought, no, we're not doing that anymore. We're going to have a 170 loop where once you commit, you're in. (laughs) So that's what it's been ever since. I mean, we still have an 85 and and the 35, which is new last year, but the 170 is definitely the the premier event. And I'm even out on the course taking pictures and I, of course, got my photography degree. So you get free free photos of yourself if you come do my event and you can't beat it, man. (laughs) I know my buddy Brent, my buddies Brent and Rob did it last year. There's a funny story about that. I, you, I think you gave like something. You give it like a little badge or something for finishers. Yeah, a patch. So, you get a free patch, like a embroidered patch, if you finish the 170. Yeah, so they they did it on fat bikes, right? And yep. They finished, and <laughs> Rob was so beat up, he grabbed the patch when Brent asked if he wanted to do it again next year, and chucked it across the truck and said, "Hell no." Well. <laughs> 
I think they're both going to do it again this year. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, there's, there's a, the story's funnier than what I said, but if if Brent were to tell it, he tells it perfect and it's hilarious. Uh, I think they might have come out the year in 2020. I had scoped out a new course. This was the first time I was trying to make a 170 course. Yeah, and in December the ground was hard and it was perfect, and I found this beautiful loop. But in the spring, I realized that there were like 70 miles of sand. And not only <laughs> not only that, but the beavers had dammed up this area. So there was like up chest deep water you had to wade through. Right. And so it was a brutal year. But I think those guys might have come out and done it that year or something. I think, yeah, maybe, maybe. But we, re- we kind of retired that course. I mean, just because it was so brutal. Yeah. <laughs> that was Todd would like that course. Yeah, the sands, of course, instead of the crayons, of course. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Can you tell me quick about your FKT on the Lakeshore Trail at Pictured Rocks? Years ago, I met some guys in college, and we got into doing these guy trips. It was basically like a long weekend or a week. We'd go to North Manitou Island or Isle Royal or Pictured Rocks or Puckasaw National Park. And we do this week long or whatever higher backpacking trip with photography. But as we got older, these guys are like, I can't, I can't go for a week. I got kids, I got a wife. And I'm like, well, I'm not willing to give up the trip. We're just going to have to pack a week's worth of stuff into like one or two days. (laughs) And so we were backpacking pictured rocks. And I think we did it over three or four days. And I told my buddy, I said, we're going to come back next year and we're doing this in one day. And he said, no, we're not. And I said, yeah, we are. So I talked him into it. And so the next year we came back and we did the 42 and a half mile trail in 14 hours. And we got to the end and the sun was setting and we joked and we said, how much would I have to pay you to turn around and walk back? And we laughed. And then about 10 years later, we did that. We we did the out and back hike, 85 miles, and it took 35 and a half hours. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. And I was almost 40. I was 39. So when I turned 49, 10 years later, we had the FKT from walking this trail. And I'm like, we could shave 10 hours off that time if we ran it. And so I found four people that were willing to start. And two of them quit at the halfway point. But another guy and I, Scott Kentner, who's a total beast and waited for me a lot, we we ran the whole thing. But it took 10 hours to do the first 42 and a half. And it took 15 hours, I think, or 15 and a half to go back because we ended up walking quite a bit at the end. But basically just, you know, one of those things to challenge yourself. And I mean, it was pretty miserable. I'm not going to lie. It was, <laughs> But I think walking it was worse than running it because you're out there for 10, 10 extra hours. Yeah, and we, have, we have the FKT. I mean, it's it's essentially because nobody else has ever done it. You know, like I'm sure there are plenty of people that could do it faster than we did. And there's, there's plenty of people that have attempted the FKT on the, the one way and yeah. they're pretty fast, but you know, turning around and going back, that was the key because it's so much longer, but you're in the dark a lot. So it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, tough. it's daunting. Yeah. It's a Go beautiful ahead. course. You know, you've got waterfalls and, waves crashing and cliffs and just beautiful stuff yeah and it's beautiful up there we've been up there we were just up there this past summer and we went to what's the rock that kind of sits with the that has the tree on it or something chapel rock or something yeah Yeah, it might be chapel rock yeah okay yeah we were, were in that area and saw some of the waterfalls too in the area so it's definitely beautiful up there yeah if you haven't been to the up go (laughs) <laughs> we've always done that that long stuff in the fall so it's no bugs and I mean, oh. you, don't have, you don't have quite as much daylight but the leaves are changing and so it's it's pretty nice it did rain on us which was not fun you know oh. when it's cold but it was still we we had a good time for sure and i met a couple of these people just as a i was coaching at margie camp for a few years and then they called me last year and said we want you to be a running coach and i'm like do you understand that like every camper there will have more experience than me running? Like, are you (laughs) sure you want me as a coach? They're like, yeah, we can't find anybody else. (laughs) (laughs) But then I met all these other cool running coaches and that's, you know, a couple of those people were the ones that 
that went with us. And so it was really, really a good time. I'm going to do that again this year, do the running coach thing. And when I was debating about doing it, you know, Tara that works with Todd said, do hard things, you know, that's their motto. So I'm like, that's probably true. You should keep challenging yourself. So I don't know <laughs> if I'm going to be able to hang with these people, but I'm going to try. Do hard things. Yeah. Talking a lot about younger kids here. If you were to give advice to younger athletes that look up to you, what would it be? I would say, you know, figure out what you're passionate about, follow that. And also just the fact that you can, you can accomplish a lot more than you think you can. I mean, like to go from my best finish in 2013, being sixth place in sport to over the winter, changing that to winning every sport race and podium, podium on every expert race. That was self-coached. I mean, I didn't even have a coach then. So if you, you know, if you enjoy the process and you, you work towards something and you structure things and you plan ahead, I mean, you can do anything you want to do, you know? So figure out what it is you want to do and then figure out how to get there and put the work in and you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. Absolutely. Yeah, those are definitely, definitely good tips there. I mean, even when I started, I was in sport too, and I didn't win anything like that my first year. And then I did the same thing. I buckled down. And then the next year in sport, I won all my sport races and then expert. And and yeah, from there, it just kept going. So nice. just keep pushing, keep yep. striving. And you can you can definitely get better every year, every day. Oh, right? Yeah. Little gains every day. Yeah, put in the work. That's what put you got to do. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you on the web? I have a YouTube channel, Blowing Rock, without Ness. So, and I do a lot of videos for Todd, so that's kind of fun. If you want to see some of these races we've talked about, there's probably videos from just about every year on there. And I'm on Facebook. That's about the only social media. Email roycrans at gmail.com. So reach out if you have questions or anything like that. Awesome. Connect with them on one of those platforms or all those platforms. Roy, I have enjoyed learning more about you today. Keep at it with the endurance events. I look forward to hearing from my buddies complain about the 170 Kranza this year after they do it. Awesome. And I, appre <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time out today to come on the podcast. Yeah, it was a blast. Thanks for having me, brother. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. And to all the listeners, Gratitude. You have just listened to Unpacking the Athlete.